Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Lab 2. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to what you're going to be doing today, and, uh, and then we'll get you started with the TAs. So uh, we're going to follow the same stuff we talked about last night in terms of having the main meeting section and then adjourning to the individual lab rooms with your TAs to get some advice. And the things you'll be doing today during the lab, you'll be following the main event page as you have before, filling in the blanks and answering the questions as best you can. One lab report per group handed in a week from today uh, before 1130 at night. First off, you're gonna put your circuit together and, uh, and test your sketch code. The schematic of the circuit looks like this. And that's sort of an artist's conception. The real thing looks more like this one. And so what you can see here is that yellow wire there running from A0 to A4 is this yellow jumper here. I've moved the photo cell over to pin uh, A3, as is indicated here. And the photo cell this time around is connected to the plus 3.3 and the resistor that's connected to it is connected to the, uh, to the ground plane. Now, in this particular view, you can't see exactly what resistor I've got in there, but if I push it out of the way, that's a brown, black, red. That's one, zero, and two more zeros. So that's a thousand ohm resistor. And I picked that based on the uh, resistance that I measured last week with my particular photo cell. So your choice will be up to you what resistor you put in there and it'll depend on what photo cell you've got because they're all different. Everybody's got a different one in their kit and it'll also depend on what resistors you happen to have in your kit and available to make a good choice from. So there isn't a single absolutely right answer there. You need to pick a good resistance that'll allow you to get reasonable response from your photo cell. This thermistor here is an artist's conception. This is a resistance element that changes its resistance with temperature. Over in the real world, it looks like this, that uh, little stainless steel cartridge there. And it's connected down here. This black wire runs off and around a loop, eventually comes back here to this uh, little white uh, connector that I've connected with two leads, the green and gray leads there, to go to pin uh, A5 and to ground. So we're gonna measure the thermistor resistance in our ohmmeter circuit the same way we measured the photocell resistance last week. Now, in setting up, you should have made some uh, adjustments additions to this analog sensors code, but this is the sample code that, uh, that we were talking about yesterday. And I've got mine running here. It's spitting out uh, some push button values. So changing from one down to zero, plus three analog read values from the pins that I'm interested in. I haven't done the work yet to convert that into voltages or come up with a percentage value for, uh, for what's falling on the photo cell. So you guys should be ahead of me on that one. So you should have some output like this stuff uh, down here with some additional values in there, converting to voltages around say 1.5 for something around 30,000 and having a percentage number over here for how much light is falling on the photocell. And you can change all of that around to get it right in the lab today. Once you've got that right and you can figure out what the percentage is for the illumination, and that's going to be largely a judgment call, you want zero to be dark and 100 to be bright. So right now it's reasonably bright light. If I shade the photocell, whoops, better put my hand over it. Shade the photo cell, its value goes down to about uh, 7,800. So I might say that 7,800 corresponded to 20%. And uh, 
28,000 corresponded to 70%. And if I shine my, uh, my phone on it, I'm gonna get even a higher number. So I need to translate those into a zero to 100% range. And as we all know, we probably shouldn't go under zero or over 100. So you might wanna put an if statement in there to make sure you're not going out of range. Once we've got that percentage, we're gonna decide how much illumination we want to have in our room lights. Because if it's dark, if we're detecting that it's dark, we'd like to increase the lighting from the room lights. And we're gonna simulate those room lights uh, with pin 13, which is controlling the little red LED on our microcontroller, the one that we were blinking last week. So you're gonna use analog right on pin 13 with some value X that's gonna be between zero and 255 to control how the LED brightness changes. And you can just experiment with that a little bit to, to figure out how that works if you like. Uh, you're also going to uh, produce an output voltage on pin A0, which is a, a pin that can write analog values out, not just digital values and write out a value to that corresponding to uh, uh, the, uh, the LED brightness that you're trying to set. So that you can follow that one on, if you write it out to pin A0, you can read it on pin A4, and that's that uh, output voltage that you're measuring in the middle, sorry, in this one, this one, the third one that gets printed out is that output voltage. So when you write something out to here, you should see a corresponding change on the input over here. So once you're finished with this, you should be able to shade the LED, or sorry, shade the photocell and see the LED light get brighter, just the way you would expect some automatically controlled interior lights to brighten up when the exterior light from the, uh, from the sun dims down and you need to augment it. Then you're gonna collect some time series data. And this is simply a matter of you've got everything running now, you've got the LED working, collect some data where you increase the temperature of the temperature sensor, you change the lighting on the, uh, LED, on the photo cell and get some transient data that you can look at and plot a graph of. Now I'm going to, uh, right over here, I'm gonna take this, uh, thermistor and I'm going to grip it between my fingers so its temperature should be going up. And let's watch over here at this first column. You'll notice that voltage value is going down. So as I've warmed it up that voltage value has dropped. And then when I let go of it and it can cool off, eventually that voltage value will start to come back up again as it cools down to the, uh, the temperature of the room. There, we're starting to see it come back up again now as it's cooling off. This time around, you're not going to actually convert that to a temperature. You're just gonna be aware that it's happening. Later on in lab uh, seven, we are going to actually make some transient temperature measurements to see how temperatures are changing with time. And at that time, we'll use both the uh, thermistor and the photocell. So it says, <clears throat> if possible, monitor the thermistor output on the oscilloscope. You guys don't have an oscilloscope, but you will be able to watch it in your transient measurements from, uh, from your own code. So you'll still be able to see how much noise it's got on it. Does it bounce up and down quite a bit, or is it really nice and steady? And you'll be able to comment on that. This one, you're gonna skip unless you've got a multimeter. And even if you've got a multimeter, I'm betting you're not gonna admit you've got a multimeter this week. And you're gonna leave this for lab four where we'll do a simulated calibration. But what you should do is have a look at this section anyway to understand the ideas behind calibrating your analog to digital converter. We know that it probably goes from zero to 65,000 as we go from zero to 3.3 uh, volts, but we need to be able to confirm that. 
And down here is an example of what we get when we try to confirm that. That is a very convincing straight line. Nice linear response going from zero up to five volts as it goes from on an UNO zero up to 1024. So this is a pretty good analog to digital conversion unless we zoom in and just look at the difference between where these data points are and where this straight line is. And that difference, that variation is measured in millivolts. So five volts, one millivolt is one five thousandth of full scale. That's a really small variation, but it's something we need to know the magnitude of if we're gonna be able to assess the accuracy of our measurements. So have a look at this, draw some confidence here from knowing that it really is highly linear and well-behaved, and think about what you're going to do in lab four to try to assess the quality of this data. Now, again, this is one that's gonna be difficult if you're trying to do it without an accurate multimeter. For a start, uh, you don't have a strain gauge in your hand right now. You're gonna pick those up in a couple of weeks uh, and we'll be doing the strain gauge lab on alternate weeks with different groups uh, to share the equipment around. But you should have one member of your group with a thermocouple in hand. That thermocouple will register a change in voltage of about four millivolts for the difference between room temperature and boiling water. 100 degrees C. So you're gonna have a hard time measuring that voltage. If you succeed, that's fantastic. You can comment on it. If you don't succeed, you probably wanna read the section on thermocouples and, and resistance strain gauges and think about how you're going to uh, measure those in later labs. And a hint, the thing that sits right in here on everybody's breadboard that we're not using yet, that's an instrumentation amplifier. Its whole purpose in life is to take very small voltages at the millivolt level and amplify them up to be much larger voltages at the say zero to three volts level that we can measure with our, our microcontroller. So think about this one a little bit, even if you can't make the measurements yourself because you don't have a multimeter. And final thing we're gonna to do today, you're just gonna copy this little chunk of code and paste it probably into your setup function at the start of the sketch. And it's going to go 10,000 times around taking a, uh, a reading of, uh, of one of the uh, input ports. Um, and, uh, oh, hmm. If we're using pin A0 as an analog output port, you probably wanna make that pin A1 or some other pin than A0 today uh, to, to avoid conflicts. But what it's gonna do is it's gonna go around and take data 10,000 times without printing anything and then tell you how long it took to do that. I hope you'll be impressed with how fast it goes and that that'll help you later on in thinking about what is it that's actually eating up the time when we are making measurements with our microcontroller. And one of the things to note is we do spend a lot of time just sending printed data out to our, uh, our serial port. And that serial communication may be one of the slowest links in our chain. So those are the things that I wanted you to do in the uh, in the lab today, are there any general questions before we move on to the TA uh, consultations? I'm sorry, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, what do we do if none of us have a thermistor? If nobody in your group has a thermistor, uh, then you're going to, um, you're not going to have thermistor data. Uh, you could, if you had two photocells, you could plug in a photocell there, or you could just report in your lab report that nobody had a thermistor and that you saw when Professor Sellens demonstrated 
that the uh, voltage went down when he warmed up the thermistor and went back up again when he let it cool off. And that would be uh, enough for this time around. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and send an email and we'll try to get you in touch with uh, uh, Reza and make sure that you do have a thermistor accessible for your group when we get to, uh, to lab four. Other questions? Okay, well, that's great. Now would be time to start the meeting with your TA so, and, and with your uh, individual groups so that you can work on the lab together and, uh, and get some results. Um, one last thing I'll mention, getting that data out to a CSV file, most of you succeeded. Uh, however, what you might want to do if you got a really weird graph uh, last night where you were trying to graph uh, strings of data so that you had a whole lot of overlapping data labels on your axis, you might want to have a look at this link here to getting data to a CSV file that talks about details of how to get it in this form in an actual text file on your computer or how to get it translated text to columns in Excel so that you can make sure that you're reading numbers and not reading strings. Uh, a lot of you had, or some of you had uh, excess quotation marks showing up in your CSV file, which made your Jupyter Notebooks assessment think that they were strings rather than numbers. So best of luck. I will still be here in this meeting and, uh, and we will uh, get this going.